yeah, my background, the UBC bookstore, you might not immediately relate that to uh, food. So obviously this won't just talk about food, but other, um, other products that are available at UBC and how the two tie together. Um, and I guess my background as well, as you can tell, I'm English. Uh, I helped to roll out the uh, in national food standards in the UK to change eating habits of children because the food was horrendous in England. So that's one of my interests. The other of my interests is I'm studying, uh, studying this subject outside of work as a master's. So, uh, okay, so it's not just about the bookstore. We are a much, uh, much bigger campus team. So there's um, SHHS, uh, which includes food services, um, engineers without borders, seeds, um, Borders, Seeds, um, and the UBC Bookstore. Uh, it was just a quick introduction to fair trade and how um, the movement started, particularly with tea. Most of us probably don't think that we often, but actually some of you grew our coffee, our tea, our coffee, our bananas. And actually, if you look at what's happened over the past decade to the prices of those products, they've been in free fall. And that means, at the end of the day, the farmers are getting less and less money to feed their families, but also to tackle poverty in their villages. There are actually millions more farmers queuing up to join fair trade, but they can only do that if you and I are buying more fair trade. We've increased our business over, over a period of the last 15 years, and more so in the last five years, because of more requirement on fair trade teas. Not only that, now uh, the, the world is also looking at much more ethical uh, teas which come from uh, different parts of the world. We've got big ambitions about really taking fair trade to scale so that millions more farmers and workers in developing countries can benefit. But they can only benefit from fair trade if you and me buy fair trade products. That's why we're calling on everybody to join the big swap. A million and one swaps is what we're aiming for. The impact of you buying the fair trade product, what it does to the villages and the communities of the farmers is incredible. And I think that that's the problem we have in trying to let people know over here, just trying to get them to understand what their lives are like and what their lives were like before fair trade came in and got involved, you know, because when I went to visit these villages in India, I was so moved by the fact that the families and the community, they all work together. They're having to decide, is it more important to have clean drinking water or is it more important to have schools? And that's why they're calling on us as a proud nation of tea <coughs> to buy more fair trade tea. We have a duty to bring the whole world together into one big community where we're all looking out for each other. Just going to give you a bit of a background to what UBC's compliance is for fair trade. Um, I don't think people understand that UBC is Canada's first fair trade campus and what that actually means and how it started. Um, <clears throat> the concept of no sweat, which is closely linked to fair trade. Um, the process, so how, for example, the bookstore adopted fair trade as well as the university and what challenges we faced. Uh, we have faced in doing something like this, but also the successes and what one of the main initiatives are that we're working on right now, which is uh, UBC's first Fair Trade Week. So what is Fair Trade? Um, just to give you a definition as to where I'm coming from, it's to connect disadvantaged producers and consumers and provide fairer trading conditions. It's not just about combating poverty, um, but it's you know, self-ownership and it's also taking into account environmental standards um, as to how products are grown. So for UBC to become fair trade compliant, it actually began in 2004 and the AMS uh, president at the time actually got coffee introduced. Um, but to become fully compliant, there are another a number of other products that the, the university or any other campus university has to look at. One was we needed tea and we needed at least three choices in any AMS or food services outlet. Chocolate, so wherever you go in terms of, um, again, a food services outlet or the AMS, they had to have a choice of fair trade. 
and there are a number of other products that they had to look at increasing. So every purchasing manager on campus has a, res a responsibility to look at the products they're sourcing, which, as we've said, do not just include food. They could include clothing, uh, such as cotton, so uniforms for staff, um, all those kind of related products. Visibility, so the UB UBC has a... Um, a responsibility to make people aware of what fair trade product is, where it's available, and what their role is. And it also had to have a fair trade committee that was um, run at the president's level. And last year, UBC became Canada's first fair trade campus because it met all those criteria. No other university in Canada has actually done that, but they are, you know, encouraged by what we did. So we're trying to help them, particularly Engineers Without Borders. I don't know if you know Engineers Without Borders, but they were responsible for the compliance at UBC. So the UBC bookstore, we started in 2004, not with food, but actually with clothing. I don't know if you know that all the clothing in the UBC bookstore is no sweat. So it does follow a fair labor policy. That actually means, um, I don't know if anyone knows what the Fair Labour Association is, but Apple uh, in the last few weeks announced that it's going to become part of the Fair Labour Association, which um, they have had issues with their uh, workforces and work practices abroad that you may have seen some of the public relations stories. So they've now agreed to join the Fair Labour Association. It was um, incorporated in 1999, and it's a collaborative effort of colleges, universities, and civil society organizations, as well as companies, to improve working conditions in factories around the world. So there are a number of um, issues as companies continue to grow and diversify their supply chains. It's vital they have the systems in place to protect their workers. So no sweat means that any clothing vendors supplying to the bookstore are expected to comply with guidelines which include no forced labor, no child labor, no harassment or abuse, no discrimination of any type, including sexual um, termination, uh, race, religion. There's not allowed to be any of that type of discrimination. There's very strong women's rights wages and benefits, hours and works, and environmental guidelines. So any factory that works with us has to sign off on those um, terms. And that's quite similar to what some of the fair labor practices and guidelines are for food as well. So we started with that, and there are now 200 colleges and universities in North America who also are members of the FLA. Um, but we have moved on to many other, looking at many other products in partnership with the university. So in terms of challenges for the bookstore and the university in general, in Europe, fair trade is very far advanced. In Canada, it's been very challenging for us to find suppliers. For example, when we do our trade shows, where we go and meet possible vendors and suppliers, out of a thousand suppliers, 20 of them are fair trade registered. Most of these are actually US companies, so um, we actually want to work with Canadian companies as much as we can. Um, and so this is one of the key challenges that we face. Not many people know the exact definition of fair trade. So when it first came to campus, or in the last few years, people said, is it free trade? I know what free trade is. No. Some people confuse it with organic, local, sustainable. So when they see uh, a product, you know, they're not quite sure, and they think it's another fad or a marketing term. So we have to work to build the education piece before people even make that conscious decision to buy the products. So what we did is we worked with the Sorder School of Business, all the partners that I've mentioned. Um, one of the student groups chose to do fair trade as one of their projects, and they actually commissioned research across the whole campus. I don't know whether any of you saw the survey, but we're hoping that some of you did, uh, as it was a link that was sent out as widely as possible. And it was looking at what uh, the knowledge is of what products are available, where they're available, do people know what fair trade is? 
46% were aware of what fair trade is, but said they'd never seen a single product on campus. Um, the other issue that we have is around support. So, okay, 46% said they were aware of what fair trade is, but do students really care what, about fair trade on this campus? Are we seeing a big movement to even want to buy those products? I guess as a student, one of the key issues is pricing around fair trade products. So, you know, they're more expensive because more of the money is going back to the workers. The funny thing is, the more that we buy, the cheaper the prices would become. So, for example, in the UK, where fair trade is very prevalent and you go into any supermarket and the majority of products are fair trade, um, or they just meld with the rest of the products that you'll see, the prices has come down to match pretty much any other product that's in the store, whereas here there is a big price discrepancy at the moment um, between fair trade. Not so much on coffee supply on campus because there's such a wide supply, but uh, for other products it's a pricing. And people don't understand where that money's going, so of course they're, they're not willing necessarily to pay the price difference. Then the certifications, so there's a confusion around the logo. On the, the black and white logo is kind of an existing logo that you might see that's actually being phased out. The actual global standard is the green and blue. The green and blue makes it very easy to identify. The trouble is it's very hard to get certification. So um, you may know the store called 10,000 Villages. Nothing that they sell is fair trade certified because they can't get the certifications. They don't use the term fair trade. But all their products, most of the money, will go back um, to the actual farmer or producer who produced the product. It's easier for food to be fair trade certified, but not for many other products. So it's a deep, you know, if you have that symbol and it's great and you can understand the concept, but when you can't use that symbol, that visual identity is actually lessened considerably. So in the bookstore, we do have um, accessories. We have chocolates. We have teas in partnership with food services. We have creams and we're bringing in soccer balls. So no, we don't have a huge range of fair trade product, but as I said, all the clothing is no sweat. And then we also have things like Tom's shoes, which are about, you know, a sustainable product in a way because a pair is bought and a pair is given to a child in need and also out of print t-shirts where the product or the proceeds go to um, Books for Africa. So they're all variations on the sustainable theme. So another of our key successes, as I mentioned, have been the partnerships that we've built on campus. So a lot of uh, other campuses where they're failing is they're trying to run it just through students and they don't have the, um, the actual staff or administrative support for the initiative. So that's where we're quite lucky. And then, as I said, we've worked a lot with students and SORDA, Faculty of Land and Food Systems. Obviously, that's a key area of interest for the students and their awareness was 93% of fair trade and um, go beyond and UBC Common Energy. So, one of the first um, things that we are doing in terms of partnership is we are running um, the campus's first Fair Trade Week. So we've decided to run a number of creatives. Uh, there will be, most of them will focus on food. So there'll be coffee, tea, bananas, chocolate. But we decided to increase that and make people aware that there are other products available. What's really funny is we couldn't get the right stats. Uh, the first one is coffee. It's easy to get stats on coffee and how much money goes back to a farmer, if it's fair trade or non-fair trade. But you can't get that for many other products. It's just not available, no matter how far and wide you look. So that's definitely an, an issue. People don't, it, apparently it's 10 times, but we're not, uh, that's not, you know, actually written down anywhere. So we're going to have creatives that will be going up, and this is all in support of um, Fair Trade Week. So if you would like further information, uh, UBC Food Services is hosting the page, as you can see there, Fair Trade Week. It's not live yet, and that's why I've put the other link first for you. 
We will be having a flash mob fair at the bookstore with vendors and suppliers, free coffee hours all across campus, the scavenger hunt, uh, a movie around fair trade food, lunch and learns, and surveys taking place before and after so we can measure the awareness that um, whether there is actually any increase in knowledge about where fair trade products are and what they actually are on campus. So, um, what do I think, what would we like to ask you to actually do as a result of um, learning about fair trade and the partnerships on campus? If uh, you should join in Fair Trade Week, you can actually volunteer or you can take part in the flash mob dance, which uh, the training session takes place on March the 1st at 12.30 at the Vanier Upper Atrium or in the sub next to the deli on March the 5th. Um, you can dress up as a banana, coffee, tea, uh, a range of other exciting types of food. Um, ask others whether they know what fair trade means, what UBC's role is and where products are available. Try the products and let us know if you think it's still hard to find information out after fair trade week, because that's what we're looking for. Thank you. I wanted to talk about fair trade at the end, but we just talked about fair trade, so I want to continue the story. Um, we are the largest importer of fair trade fruit and vegetables into Canada, um, and that's my job. I get to do all the travel, and I'm sort of going back to my childhood, as it were, uh, doing all the things I wanted to do before. Um, I, I'm in Mexico, uh, Peru, or Chile about what, once every three weeks, it seems. I never get the yard work done and I forget which day garbage goes out, it's that often. Um, these pictures, um, I very often we do videos and camera footage and still photography for our website, so the pictures you've seen right now are visits we've done in the last month. Uh, There's a co-op of 3,500 quinoa growers in the highlands of Ecuador, and um, I'll, do, I'll, um, I'll run through this really quickly. Miranda at the back is actually our fair trade marketing manager and she was in Ecuador working um, with CETA and she set that all up. Um, but you're just going to see some slides go by and I'll just talk about it briefly. Um, the fair trade world is going through a huge revolution right now. Um, in the last year or two there's been a huge amount of um, oh, uh, kerfuffles too small a word. Um, fair trade, the, the, the fair trade market you're used to seeing and the fair trade world was designed to help small groups of growers, producers, whether it's cotton or tea or coffee or bananas, basically um, stand in the way of the status quo of the, of the world trade system, which has been going on since you know, Marco Polo started traveling around the world um, buying pepper. And um, what happens for... Oh, i got to stop for this. This is a summer school for 1,100 kids in a town where we buy bananas. And uh, they even did a banana dance when they heard it was, uh, it was coming. We alone generate about $2,700 a week in social premiums that go to this one town. Just on our banana purchases, which is one-tenth of the bananas produced in that town, which are now all sold as fair trade. Explain social premiums. Oh, sorry, I will. Um, anyhow... We were able to finance a summer school for every kid in this town, 1,100 kids. So I was there last week, and they did a banana dance, and, and it was just an overwhelming deal. Social premiums, this is a big part of fair trade that people don't hear about. When we negotiate with a grower to buy their bananas for X number of dollars, we also pay an additional $1 per box. It varies product to product, but on bananas, it's a dollar a box, and that goes back to the community. The community has to decide what to do with that money. In the case of these banana cooperatives, they're taking in $60,000 a year. Am I doing something wrong? Sorry, I'm just going to turn this a little oh, bit just for the okay. camera. Is that better? <coughs> I, thought it was, I thought it was yelling loud enough. No. Anyway, that, that community is now taking in $6,000 a week, $7,000 a week, just our co-op alone. So 
60 containers, sixty thousand dollars a week in social premiums going into this one region. So they've been able to put windows in the high school or windows in the elementary school, create a high school, technical college, university scholarships, medical programs. Our co-ops just put in a dental clinic and a medical clinic, social counseling. Uh, they're buying the soccer team uniforms. They have a microfinance system in the community now that has four or five hundred mil, a thousand euros floating in it. So any worker of any of the co-ops, and there's 3,700 families, have access to all this. That's the, that's the most important part of fair trade. Getting a fair price is certainly absolutely important. The, fair, the social premium is much more important. This is what it goes to. The, there's a sign that you'll see in here that, that basically says education is our best investment. These are all school kids on summer holiday learning stuff. Um, but what's happened uh, in the fair trade movement is it's become, um, oh, just like Chevron and all, where they're all for the environment ads, it's become a huge amount of greenwashing and fair washing. And there's been a race to the top for each company and a big corporation to try to make themselves come off like they're, the, you know, they're doing so much for everybody. And, and what happens is we've now got, gone from one major certifier two years ago, being the fair trade mark you just saw, to now 18 certification systems in two years. All very valid. Um, uh, a lot of them are for-profit systems that are used to certifying other things. Um, we've, got, um, we've got a breakaway from the idea that it's just for smallholders, so now um, uh, fair trade internet, or, Fair Trade USA, who um, are part of this Fair Trade movement, certified Dole last year for bananas. Rainforest Alliance um, has just certified huge plantations owned by Chiquita, Dole, Nestle's, and other major corporations. So it's a big debate right now about, you know, there's millions and millions of farmers out there in the produce world, plus all these coffee and tea producers and textiles and all the rest. But we're talking about the livelihoods of millions and millions of people, and they've and they've they're clinging to this fair trade hope that for the first time in their culture, they're actually going to get paid fairly and not just ripped off by the white people from the north, which is what we are. <clears throat> um, at least I am. Um, so the, um, there's, a, there's going to be a lot of confusion, I think, in the fair trade industry as we see more and more labels. We already have three fair, three fair trade certifications for different products we bring in. <clears throat> and it's going to be exactly the way organic food was 10 or 15 years ago, where there was 280 different certified organic standards in North America. Now there's two. There's many, many certifiers, but we're meeting standards. And I'm currently on the North American Fair Trade Stakeholders Council. Oh, there's me. Um, um, where we're trying to actually come up with a North American standard that all fair trade certifiers would have to certifiers would have to um, meet, which I think is just part of the whole industry growing up. But it's true, fair trade is nothing in Canada. It's much less in the U.S. Compared to, compared to Europe. And I'm hoping that we get there fast. It's, it's like pulling teeth sometimes. But two years ago, we brought the first container of bananas from this town that weren't sold through Dole. And now, and now 80, per, 80 or 85 percent of all the bananas sold from that town, which is 60 containers, 60,000 cases a week, are now sold fair trade. And Dole now has to pay for them as fair trade to even get them. So we turned that whole town around. But when we were first bringing them in, we were selling two or 300 a week. Now we're selling 2,700. So we're seeing, that's, per, that's cases. So we're seeing pretty steep growth, but not like it is in Belgium, where 57 percent of the bananas are sold as fair trade, as opposed to 0.1 percent in the U.S. But it's a huge movement. Anyhow, um, we came here to talk about other things other than fair trade, but I'm going to amazingly talk about local food, sustainability, business models, um, and work it back into this by some magic. Um, let's talk about local food, because it's really big in the news. It's really big in people's heads. Um, we, we have um, an unlimited amount of, of uh, local fruit. We're a mass exporter of fruit. We are the biggest grower of raspberries in the world. We export a million pounds a day, or we, we collect a million pounds a day, which we freeze and export all around the world. It's a contest between us and Romania, Romania or Belarus or somewhere, anyhow, but it's close. It's over a million pounds a night we harvest and freeze in the Fraser Valley. 90% of the hazelnuts we grow go south. You can find BC apples in Korea, Japan, Australia, Guadalajara produce market in central Mexico, Argentina, Europe. We produce tons of apples. There's no shortage of these products. We have a marketing system that makes sure that we don't overgrow and only have enough um, parsnips, turnips, carrots, potatoes, cabbage, hmm? cabbage um, 
yeah, there's an entire marketing system that controls the root crop production so we don't overproduce because it's hard for us to compete in the U.S. on those products. The place where we're missing is in vegetables. Vegetables have to be grown on bottomland. We only have a very short three-and-a-half-month frost-free period to grow them in. And we have two things that are really problematic, and it's hard to explain to people when they say, why can't we get local this and local that? They're really talking about broccoli and lettuce and and... They're not talking about apples and peaches because we, we know that part. It's because we value our agricultural land as if it was going to have a big box store put on it. So if you were going to go out, you, yes, you, were going to go out and start a farm tour in the Fraser Valley, you'd have to put down a million and a half dollars just to buy 20 acres of farm, which is the lowest level you'll have, or lowest amount of land you'd be able to grow on successfully. And do you have a really rich dad? No? I'm, I'm talking to you. Yes. Do you have a really rich dad? Are you farming? You? No? Okay. You're never going to farm. Give it up. Even in... Everywhere where we have good growing land, the bottom land, where the rivers are, that's where Kelowna is. That's where um, Sorrento and, and Salmon Arm are and Nelson and every other major center. They're not on top of the mountains. They're, in, they're right on the agricultural land. So our agricultural land is way too expensive. And the second thing is that you'd think the government would be, yeah, let's have more local production. The government's all about us growing food crops for biofuel and food crops for export. So we've lost 10,000 acres of some stunning growing land in the Fraser Valley to blueberries because blueberries are full of antioxidants and there's no limit to the amount of blueberries we can grow until two years from now when people find out that there's something else that's better. So lo growing local, in increasing the supply of local food, fresh produce, is, it's tough. People want more and more. We can't get more and more. In fact, this year we had to actually bring in more lettuce and kale and chard and parsley than ever before from growers in Washington, Oregon. And we can't consider a farm in Mount Vernon, even though it's an hour drive away, local, because they're Americans, but we consider food from Prince George local, even though it's farther away than California. So there's always some problems about defining what local is. Um, but the area where, and if you're looking at a business model, the area where we can actually grow our economy, do it in a very sustainable way, do it in a profitable way, and do it in a way that helps farms out, is in, is in processed food, which is what most people eat. Soup, jams, jellies, salsa, dried apples, blah, blah, blah. We can grow any amount of that, and we can, we can take it through a processing plant and produce higher value products, that will sell well and that are extremely competitive and, and this is why <clears throat> all that stuff I just mentioned especially when you look at dried fruit and and uh, pastes and all the rest of it food's 99% not 99% water but 90% water at least and the cost of moving food around the world is incredibly expensive um, I'm going to tell about Herman Brun's cabbage there's a grower up in Mara BC who grows big storage cabbages. He loves them. He keeps them in his root cellar. And in January, he figures, well, the price on cabbage is really good. He peels them down and he wants to get a dollar a pound. Not going to happen, Herman. It's going to be 70 cents. <clears throat> so we bring, we bring cabbage down from the northern um, interior to sell, and it costs 28 cents a pound to get it from just north of Vernon to here. That's half the value right there. And that's only going to get worse, well, it gets worse and worse seemingly every day. It costs us an exorbitant amount of money, $5,000 for us to bring a truck of produce from L.A. to Vancouver. $5,000. It doesn't matter if it's full of lettuce or not. With the, on the conventional side, it's actually, the produce in the truck is worth less than the cost of getting it here. That's how expensive it is. So if, if any of you are thinking about trying to put together a plan, <clears throat> either a business plan or idea or even a, an essay, um, about increasing local food supply, about sustainability, that's where your model is. It's taking the 30% of food that's produced on local farms, whether they're here or in Armstrong or in Pemberton or on Vancouver Island, and processing them, getting them all the water out of it, putting it in jars and cans, market BC grown, local, whatever, and then you've got something that people can eat year-round. And, and uh, the, the market there is huge. There's some really great examples. Um, there's two whole lines of packaged um, uh, organic jams, jellies, soups, etc. in Ontario. One of them is a private company called Ontario Zone. The other one's a cooperative. And they're using up all that cull, what's called production, all the broken carrots and the potatoes with slash marks in them and the, 
apples with bird pack holes, all the stuff that normally goes over the fence to the cows next door, or you may get um, 10 cents a pound for from a juice crushing company. Instead, we're producing really good product and it's local. Um, the other one is a place called Columbia Gorge. Um, is anyone driven from Portland East up the Columbia River Valley? No, Skeeted Timberline? You're all, I'm blank, you're, I'm getting blank faces here, obviously not. Portland, six hours south, major city, northern part of Oregon. Three hours in is a big volcano with a ski area called Timberline, Mount Hood. There's a, a really lovely little growing area there um, called Columbia Gorge, and there's about 500 farms. And they're quite isolated. It's a, it's a beautiful place to go. Um, and there's, um, there's a 160-acre organic orchard, and there's about eight other orchards. They've all packed together. Um, all the apples that are really good, they put in boxes and they ship all over the place. And then anything that isn't as good, they make applesauce and peach, um, cut peaches like you would buy in the grocery store, canned cherries, um, pear slices. There's five of them. I can't remember the fifth one. So that's a that's a now a market that they've established uh, in natural food stores all across Washington, Oregon where you see their label on the fruit and then you see the label on the tin cans. Now, a lot of that stuff is, still isn't good enough, so that all gets pressed into juice. So now they have Columbia Gorge juice. So wherever you would see Happy Planet juice in Vancouver, in Portland or Seattle, you would be seeing Columbia Gorge juice. They even bring in mango and banana puree to make a huge wide range. Everything that's left goes out a, literally out a chute out the back of the, of the packing shed and it goes by, gets picked up by a front end loader and they make an incredible amount of compost which goes back on all the fruit trees. It's a complete closed loop cycle. It's the, the epitome of sustainability. They're using every bit of food. They're creating year round jobs. And, um, and that's, the, that's the, actually the growth area in the local sustainable movement. We can't actually grow much more um, here because of all the economic factors and also our weather. But what we can do is find a business model to make our, all our own stuff, the stuff that's in the middle aisles in the grocery store. Um, how much time do I have? I can go on forever. And um, 12, minutes. 12 minutes. Did you want to talk or if I just, no, I'm just, I'll let her in. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go back to fair trade. I've done 38 trips to Latin America in four years. And we work with eight co-ops of, in total, somewhere around 6,400 small growers. And on every trip, I meet a new group of growers. It was One of them was on this slideshow. Uh, impoverished people getting ripped off, it's the, it's the model. And living in conditions that are usually pretty awful. They may not consider them awful because they don't have any way of comparison. I'm going to areas where people don't own a car, they, their kids don't have shoes, but nobody else in town does either. So they actually aren't really pissed off about the guy down the street who's got a swimming pool and an SUV and goes to Cabo on the weekends because nobody does. So they're actually really happy, they're humble, no one drinks. So husbands go home after work and they play with the kids. And they all have huge families and they have huge families. That's their entertainment. Having 12 kids is just great fun. So it's a, I mean, it's a different way of thinking and being, and I think that's common over so much of the world. But these people really have nothing. And um, when, I'm, but when I'm traveling around, I take people with me, and I, and I took about six months ago, well, July, June or July, I took my cousin, who just spent working um, 40 years she was retiring as I took her. She spent 40 years working both at the Department of Indian Affairs and then working as a assistant social director for the city of Vancouver, mainly on the downtown east side. Basically spent her whole life as part of a system supporting First Nations people in a culture of welfare, handouts, um, poorly run government programs, poorly thought out ideas. And she talked to me after we got back and she said, because I told her, you're going to have an epiphany. She said, I did, but, I, but you know, when I look at this, we treat our First Nations people worse than those people are treated down there. She said, I've been on Indian reserves in northern BC where there is no education, where, this, where it's just like it is there, Andy, where people are living in really lousy conditions. But the difference up there is it's 30 below, and they don't have a toilet in their house, and they have to go crap in a ravine behind their house, where in Peru, it's lovely and balmy weather. She said, it's, a, it's just as bad. So 
So let's look at another interesting model. We're starting to focus more and more in North America on, on, uh, on the same issues that fair trade has brought up. Farm labor. Um, there's, there's now a movement in the United States, the Agriculture Justice Project, the Domestic Fair Trade Association, the Fair Trade Resource Network, that are focusing on not helping out coffee growers and, and spice growers in Sri Lanka or banana growers in Peru, but on how we treat immigrant Mexican, immigrant Philippine, um, labor all across North America, and I'm, I'm going to give you another example, and that's how we treat our workforce in the Fraser Valley, which is awful. It's just awful. It's worse than so many places in, in uh, South America. So there's, a, there's now going to be a movement. You're going to see this where, um, you know, we're just looking at no sweat clothing. Well, we're going to run into more and more people who want to label fair trade for domestic labor. Um, there's already a local certification body called Local Food Plus, and to get certified in their system, you have to prove your labor practices. And I mean, you have no idea how we treat our Punjabi workforce. There's 20,000 people work in the Fraser Valley in deplorable conditions, unsafe conditions, unsafe transportation, and then we have immigrant workers who come in and are treated terribly as well. Um, Annie, one of Annie's friends is El Salvadoran. They have a it's a Catholic church that are mostly El Salvadorans. Our Lady of Sorrows and East Fan. There you go, Our Lady of Sorrows and East Fan. And they came to us and said, look, there's a whole bunch of El Salvadorans working on a blueberry farm out in Matsqui Prairie. They're seven miles from the store. And the people who, they're, they're staying in like these portable, um, like, you know, portable trailers, but they have no way of buying food because it's like seven or eight miles walk to the nearest store near Abbotsford. So they asked if our staff would donate bicycles to them so they could ride a bike to the store and buy food. Otherwise, they're just going to live on blueberries. This is here. Welcome to Canada. So this is where fair trade is going to loop right back in here. And that is that uh, we have, I'm going to stop for a second. Four weeks ago, I was uh, visiting the Mapuche Indians in um, Cholchol, which is in far southern Chile with volcanic ash raining down on me from that volcano from that erupted six months ago. And I drove around and I looked at 37 different people's houses, all on, an, all on a reservation. The same, pardon my English, but shitbox housing that we have provided to, to the, the people on all our reserves through Western Canada. Terrible, terrible living conditions, infrequent water, no sanitary, no school, uh, four-wheel drive roads, and so they've been handed out money, welfare. They've been handed out housing, welfare. They've had nothing to look forward to, no, no self-determination. So the government decided, we're going to teach them how to grow raspberries. So they handed them all out, thousands of raspberry plants. And these people, they're not, agri they're not agriculturally oriented. They live in the forest on highlands, 20 degree slopes. And they have hacked out the forest and planted rows and rows and rows of raspberries in this beautiful, rich volcanic soil. No water, not knowing what they're doing. And, and, then, and then they had a meeting with me and they said, would you invest money with us? And I, it broke my heart. I said, you know, no, you have no way, you, you never meet food safety standards for harvesting. You don't have a cooler, you don't have refrigeration, you don't have electricity, you don't have any place to take the berries. You can't export them. They're not, you won't even get them to market in time to, fr to freeze them. The only way, place you're going to sell them to is each other. And the berries are this high because there's no water. There was little tiny dried out berries on them. And I just felt heartbroken. And, and I just, but I looked around and I thought, I could just as easily, because I was that far south, have been in Dog Creek or Adams Lake or some of the, of the reservations in central BC. Same growing conditions, same people, same political process. That's, that's where we're going to take fair trade next. That's, that's my mission anyhow. And if you're writing a business plan, then that's, that, or, or looking at how we can, how we can combine local economic sustainable, environmental, food justice, fair labor, all those things that we've talked about just in the last hour into one. It's, it's involving First Nations to make their own decision without government intervention to grow, produce, package, process food that grows on their land. Their land's free. They're way ahead of everybody else. They paid for that land with blood, don't get me wrong, but they have the land, they have the water, and they have the capability of growing wild harvesting so I'm giving you the best new thing of the day right here is if you want to make a change in the world, it's to work with a First Nations group, with a local band office towards 
producing, I'm not talking about big scale here, I'm just talking about let's build a model to actually be able to produce something that they grow, they pick, they harvest, whether it's canned salmon or salmon berries or Saskatoon berries or potatoes, whatever it is, and build a model that represents all these different factors. Uh, if you're growing for, if you're going to market directly to the consumer, that's fine. I mean, you can extend your season with, you know, cold frames and cloches and things like that and then you can get that product out and you're getting the full value the full retail dollar for that i'm a buyer in our company i buy product every day that's all i do and no i can't phone anybody in bc and and buy a full pallet of box 42 boxes of kale with 24 bunches in a box that are all picked within 24 hours cooled you know twist ties ice on the top paper on the top that wholesale level is really important. The people who are growing for marketing directly to consumers are really important because what they're doing is they're really facing consumers and saying, yeah, I want three bucks for this. Sure, you can buy it for 69 cents imported in a grocery store, but I grew this, I grew it here, this money's gonna stay home, this is totally 100% benefit to our society here, I want three bucks. And they're looking back at you and they're thinking, yeah, you're right, I'm gonna give you three bucks. But at the wholesale level, it's about cheap, cheap, and cheap. So for us to be doing fair trade stuff with our business, is t it's swimming upstream. It's a huge pain in the butt. It's really difficult to do. It's, it's arguing with other wholesalers about why we're paying more for stuff and how come we got to buy that stuff when they didn't. Um, my husband and I run a, distri a distribution warehouse. So 12,500 12 square feet of coolers. And we have 35 employees and we ship pallet loads of produce. We bring in truckloads of produce and container loads by sea of banana. Banana and mango we try to bring in by sea. We bring in truckloads of, of produce from, at this time of the year, California and Mexico. But our apples come in from the interior and anything else we root crops that we can get. And then we build orders in our warehouse and we ship them out to stores all over Western Canada. Uh, and in addition to that, through Randy's work with the uh, banana growers in northern Peru, we also sell fair trade bananas by the sea container load. They, they go from Peru by water into Oakland. That's a, it's a really great picture for the carbon footprint. It's way better to go that way. Um, and that way, they, these folks in Oakland can then promote fair trade bananas to their community there. So that's, we're not doing retail work, but we supply the retailers and home deliveries and in the north, big groups of growers get together and buy, you know, two cases of apples and four cases of potatoes or whatever it is they can't grow. And we ship that to them as well. We have to have fair trade right now. We have to have fair trade because the people who grow food for us that we can't grow for ourselves, either because of what it is, tropicals, or because of our short season. And, I mean, I should say, I, we work also with local growers to try and extend our local seasons and storage crops as much as we can every year. We're always pushing, trying to push that boundary so we have more storage potatoes, more storage parsnips, and the things that we can have here so those livelihoods stay home. But we have to have fair trade right now because the people who grow our food all the rest of the time, like a third of the world's economy is food. Over 85% of the agricultural workers in the world are women of color, and they're getting screwed. They're really, really getting screwed, and we can stop that just like we can, like we've been able to do a lot. Individual people can do a lot by just talking about it, talking about it with the people that you buy food from and saying, you know, where does this come from? Do you know anything about where, who the grower is and how much they're getting paid? Well, in a fair trade system, it's all documented. We're audited all the time for that stuff. If people use the word fair trade, it's fair trade. Um... If you said it's fair, if you see fairly traded, eh, I have my ifs, because then you're down to that person making the decision without being audited. But for, for instance, with Whole Foods, they have, if it's fair trade, it has a whole trade sticker on it. That's their brand, but they only use that brand on product that's certified by Flow or by EMO, Flow being the Fair Trade Labeling Organization, EMO is the Institute for Market Ecology in, in Germany. The green, the fair washing you'll see is when companies talk. Uh, there's a Tim Hortons ad out there right now about, and it's got a Tim Hortons buyer out sort of drifting through the coffee plant beans and mm -hmm. that with, and they're talking something, but they're not certified. 
Um, some of those organizations will get a separate private certification that is basically meaningless. People on the ground, they're hoeing the potatoes or they're spinning the cotton or they're, they're tapping the rubber and making insoles for shoes. They don't sell that stuff. They don't know how to do that. These aren't people who do what they do because they went to university and said, oh, I want to make running shoes for a living. These are people who are doing that because dad and mom did it and because granddad and grandmom did it and their education has come that way. They probably didn't go to school. Most of them didn't. There's two billion people tilling the soil, growing things for the other five billion of us. It's, it's a huge percentage of the world's population. So they sell stuff to what we call coyotes. And those are people who are smart, have money in their hand, and they come around and say, oh, we'll buy those avocados for 10 cents each. And they go, oh, that's great. And then those people pack it, export it, mark, make huge markups, send it by sea container to a sharky importer in North America who goes, oh, Oh, yeah, that's a good price. I think I can make a 45% markup on those. And then the importer goes to trade shows and sells that product to wholesalers who then sell it to retailers who then send it to you. And in between that grower is getting five cents an avocado and you are paying $1.99 at Whole Foods, somebody's making a lot of money in between. It ain't, and it actually isn't the retailer and it certainly isn't the farmer. It's all those levels. That's what fair trade was set out to do was to cut out all those middlemen. It's, it's direct trade. I go to Peru and I buy bananas and I sell them to the retail stores. I go to Peru and I buy mangoes and avocados and go to Mexico and buy grapefruit and import them. And I'm a fair, we're, we are a fair trade licensed importer. And then we sell to retailers. We've cut out the entire produce industry in Vancouver, in fact, in Canada and most of the United States, buys all the produce from brokers. They don't want to... Whole Foods doesn't go and buy grapes in Chile. They refuse to, because if there's a problem, Whole Foods doesn't want to phone up Jose and say there's a problem with your grapes. They buy them from a broker. The broker phones up Jose and says, your grapes didn't arrive well, we're not paying you, and you owe $6,000 for the freight, which happens all too often. The, the big difference of fair trade, and this is the primary difference, is a lot of the products that are bought and sold in the world, the person who's producing them doesn't even know how much they're going to get paid for them until the money's in the, in the cash register and the fat lady's son. They have no idea. Even our local, supply, local growers send their food to us and through the system and they don't know for sure how much they're going to get paid for it until we've sold it and paid them for it. In the U.S. it's a law that the grower actually controls their produce until they've been paid for it, but nobody, all the people in between don't actually have any ownership of it. When, when produce goes from a farm in California to us, we don't get an invoice for it. We get something that's called a passing. They have simply passed the food to us to sell on their best behalf and get them the best return. That's the way the world economy works. It's a, called a liquidation. And at the end, after we've sold everything, we tell the grower, this is what you're getting. And this is the way huge companies get way, way bigger is they give bad liquidations. They rip off farm and say, oh, your fruit was crap. We're only giving you $2 a box. Well, they're selling it for 18 But a bunch of growers, not stupid people, but have no market intelligence, who've never got paid more than 250 a case, what do they know? They don't have shoes or money for gas. How are they going to have a computer and check the records online or come up here and, and figure it out? This is where fair trade sets a bar. We have to go and actually, in writing, take, pro take full ownership of that product the minute it's on the boat. We have to guarantee the growers that they're going to get a price that we work out with them to make sure they're going to make money on it. And then we only bring into the country what we know we're likely going to sell. Where in the general produce business, a buyer may go to a farm and say, ah, I can sell all that. And he's got a nice suit and he came in a chauffeured car and he's got a nice website and business cards. And the growers go, well, okay, and shake hands. No contract, nothing's fixed. He brings in all their pineapple, doesn't sell it, goes back to growers and says, sorry, couldn't sell your pineapple. Growers don't get any money. There's no lawsuit. There's no contract. There's no deal. It's just... They just pass the fruit along, hoping someone would sell it. That's in every fair trade market, in every commodity, whether it's coffee or tea or whatever, it's the grower gets paid a profitable price plus a social premium for the community, and then the onus is on us as importers to make sure that we don't go crazy and bring in too much. Because if we do, we're the people who get hung, not the growers. I'll give you a quick background what I'm about. Uh, chef, 35 years, obviously I look like a chef, I talk like a chef, I'm very direct, very honest and very transparent, which you'll see during this presentation. I don't have a PowerPoint because the one we're building now that's more 
pertinent to what I'm going to talk about is in um, being made. So what I have is I'm going to give you the visual for me. Um, I'm going to give you a, the, a chef's perspective. What our first speaker spoke and what this gentleman and this lady spoke, how I make it work. How I as a chef make the bottom line, bring it to you and make it healthy. Uh, 35 years experience, 15 here at UBC. Uh, how many of you have been to Vanier Dining Hall? A few of you, good. Is it okay? You can always say no because then I'll get the names who didn't do it right for you and figure that out. Um, I'm also a Red Seal certified chef, which means I had to go to college, etc., etc., get my grades, etc. It doesn't mean you're any better, it just means you have that diploma. Um, there's been a number of awards from Vanier. Last year we came in third overall in Canada for most vegan friendly operation. The year before we came in third overall at Vanier for most vegetarian friendly operation in Canada. One reason why we get beat out is because two of the universities, Queens and McMaster, they have their own vegetarian vegan establishment, which we now have at Loop Cafe at the Sears building, Center for Inter Interactive Research Sustainability. That's still a work in progress. We're not totally where I would be, but they're getting there. Um, with that in mind, I got voted and won Health Hero on campus in October because I talk the talk and walk the walk. So I'm gonna give you examples of that. Um, on the side, I'm also a member of Think and Eat Green. I don't know if you heard about Think and Eat Green at school. This is a five-year project funded by Ottawa, not by UBC, run by a number of professors at the Land Food Systems Department that I work with and I'm on the advisory board and I'm a co-investigator. That concept is, is to improve the food in the city of Vancouver's K-12 and high schools. Drop the Coca-Cola, drop the crap, and bring in fresh local produce. It's a tough job because there's budget, there's restraints, and the people who cook in some of these places work for the paycheck and not for the passion, which any good person will tell you, if you work for passion, you're better off. Because if you work for a paycheck, you'll never have enough money. You'll always want a better Porsche, a better iPad, iPod, whatever you want to call it, etc., etc. So if you work for passion, you sleep better at night. Um, I'm also a chef instructor and board member of Sprouting Chefs. That is where we take young kids, eight was the last group we had. They were eight years old up to 15 and we take them shopping, not to 7-Eleven, not to Safeway, but to the farms. So you know where the food actually comes from. And then we teach them how to cook healthy, with local fresh products, etc., etc. UBC Food Service, who I work for, is a self-funded operation. We are not in bed with Compass or Sodexo, etc. We do it for what is what we what I've said, which now is a motto. We do the right thing. So we are a living laboratory. We are a global leader. And I always said in the past ten years, well, if we're teaching medicine and uh, athletics, etc. Why aren't we teaching them how to eat? How come we're not telling them what the story is? So because of this now, that's why I'm doing more talking, it seems. Um, at Vanier, very important, the business card that I have, and I have actually, if you want to get back to me later on, we do not use the word cafeteria. I despise that word cafeteria. Cafeteria to me means bad food, blue-haired lady, 80 years old, works for a paycheck, not someone that is using fresh local food that has the skills to use a knife and not a pair of scissors to open up that package, plastic, throw it in the oven, take 10 minute coffee break, check the cell, and then come back and put it on the line. And it sits there for 10 days. At our place at Vanier Dining Hall, we have seven food stations, fresh produce, salad bar. Uh, we do the wok cooking to order. Uh, we have uh, the carving station, omelets. A, a funny story is when I first came there 15 years ago, I don't know how many of you eat eggs for dinner. I do, right? A lot of you have eggs for dinner. I ask, how come we don't serve eggs after two o'clock? No, oh, no, they always call you guys kids. kids. Kids don't like that. I go, really? Very interesting. I find the cook doesn't like to cook eggs after 2 o'clock. He is now working for SFU, I believe. <laughs> I actually was, I, I, I don't, I, you can see how I'm going to be with this. I actually was approached, much to the chagrin of my directors at food service, they came to see Vanny when we opened seven years ago, SFU. And when they came, they took pictures, were totally honest, transparent, we showed them what we do. And then about a half a year later, they asked me, would you like to come up for an interview? So I said, sure. Always want to see what the other fence is like, right? The other side of the fence. And I went up there and the first thing they did, they had this big, I tricked them. I said, do you have recipes made for me? 
And they said, oh yeah, it's all done for you, chef. You don't have to do anything. Really? So that's like telling, I don't know, let's say Michelangelo, it's all done for you, just sign your name. No, 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 I design, I make, I do it. And um, they wouldn't allow a, a salad bar. I said, how come you're not gonna put a salad bar out there on the out, out in the uh, dining facilities? Oh, that's a cost issue, it's a health issue. A health issue, sneeze guard, cost issue, you're too cheap, you're looking for the bottom line. What we do at uh, Vanier the last year now, it's come very popular. People always ask, what are the soups? We do make two soups from Campbell's. Well, we don't make it, we reheat it with water, right? But there's two that I make myself and now it's become very popular. Now there's a blog, Steve's Soup Scoops. And it's not to promote me because the soups I make are mostly vegan and vegetarian. We do make seafood chowder with local sustainable seafood, etc. And with that, I give the recipes. Uh, speaking of that, as of Feb 1st, UBC Food Service is now totally ocean-wise. Now, there has been some issues with that because some suppliers who've been warned way in advance have dropped the ball. So the best way to tell these people you've dropped the ball is saying you're not getting any business. Money talks. So they're now crying. We give them a box of Kleenex and say, you had two years notice. Tough. Um, what... My card, all our cards, the UBC Food Service, the back of the card says spice. That's our vision and values. What, we, what spice means, S is for sustainability, applying social, economical, and ecological business practices. P, people first. Remembering that our guests and co-workers make us successful. Innovative, providing dynamic products, services, facilities, caring, nurturing a culture of pride, integrity, respect, and fun. And E, excellence in everything that we do. We in the um, food procurement. 50% total is spent on locally raised, grown or processed within 150 miles of the campus. This, last year, 300K was spent on orga organically grown products. Source, we have cage-free, free-range eggs. We source homo hormone, excuse me, I'm gonna, hormone and antibiotic-free meat. Now, as of Fred first, we are totally ocean-wise. For food procurement also, organic produce is offered daily where we are, purchased from UBC Farm. I love this story. UBC Farm, I was giving a talk to LFS, Land Food Systems Group, and my directors were behind me, and they'll probably see this, and they love it, but they'll hate it. And I was with the four directors, three directors, purchasing director, et cetera, et cetera. And there's about 100, 200 students were saying, I said, yeah, question. They said, how come you don't use UBC Farm? This is about seven years ago, six years ago. And I said, you tell me. And then someone said, that's a logistical problem. It's an issue. It's a logistical, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, really? UBC Farm, Steve, can we set up a system? That's all it was. That's all it was. I make a phone call. Now they say, yeah, but you don't always have those products. That's why a, chef, a good chef... And this is what I was taught when I was a young boy. A good chef is flexible, adaptable, improvise, overcome, and that will go with any business. And if I can't get 50 pounds of heirloom carrots or Swiss chard or kale, I adapt, I overcome, and I improvise. That's what you should do in any business. We are, I'm not gonna mention a fair trade, the gentleman did a great job as did the lady before them. But what I will mention is, and I have all this information here, and when we do these talks, there's always that word which I hate is fad and trend. It's a trend. I hate that word trend. And I have a survey from 2012 National Restaurant Association. Now this is from the States. Canadian chefs are right on board with this. Top 20 trends. Locally sourced meat, seafood. Locally grown produce. Healthful kids meals. Sustainability. Sustainable seafood. Farm estate branded ingredients. Locally grown produce. Organic produce. Every time we go to chef's conference, it's always about sustainability, local and fresh, and making the food healthy. I had one meeting, one conference in Boston, there was about 250 chefs, a lot from the States. And one gentleman who worked 38 years as the pastry chef at the White House, Roland Meissner, amazing guy, very old school, German like me, but he said it the way it was said. And he says, there was all of us there, and I don't know how many of you know, well, I'll get to that, and he says, who's the number one chef in North America? Who's the, most, who's the best chef in North America? Someone said, Wolfgang Puck, Bobby Flay, you heard these names, Rachel Ray, etc. He goes, no, 
It's Chef Cisco. You know who Cisco is? It's a local distributor, North America. You buy all your frozen ready-made foods. He says, all you guys are getting lazy. You're just taking scissors, open up the plastic bags, throw it in the steam table, and walk away and have a cigarette. He says, you guys are all getting lazy. Get back to the basics, the way grandma and granddad cooked, and make it the right way. At UBC Farm, I'm proud to say that since that discussion with the cell phone, that this year alone at Vanier, we raised our purchases from UBC Farm by 73%. That means if you come to my place, you're going to eat kale, Swiss chard, celery root, whatever you can get. And they say, well, how can you do that? First, by telling the customer base what we do. Food literacy is so important. When you get these young students and they don't know what kohlrabi or what Swiss chard is, or better yet, they go, yuck. So there's always a way I get around that. And what I do is I give them the, I give about 30% of the so-called unknown foods or the yucky food and then mix it with the 70% of the known food. So we all like chicken noodle soup, let's say, except you're vegetarian. So when that chicken noodle soup, you'll be getting squash, Swiss chard, kale. Everybody likes potatoes. So with the potatoes red skin on, we will throw in fennel. We make our own rosemary oil from fresh rosemary from the farm. And we'll throw in Swiss chard, or we'll throw in spinach, etc., etc. And then we'll walk around to the students, which 15 years ago, that was unheard of, because they said, they're going to throw food at you. It's going to be a food fight, because you're the chef cooking here. And I said, well, hold on, whose fault is that? Is that the students' fault, or is it the fault of you guys? You guys are the ones that should be put out to uh, a penal colony or something, I think I said, Devil's Island. What you need is to get the right guy here, and get the right training and the right equipment, and do it the proper way. So, as I say, when you come to me, you'll be getting healthy food. And if it's local, fresh, organic, and we can afford it and meet the bottom line, we can. And I can tell you right on TV, our bottom line is healthy. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. I'd be out. And so would UBC Food Service. And then you're going to get the Compass Group, the Sidexos, who care about those $2 they could save by, opening, by buying another pair of scissors and opening up that plastic bag, and then et cetera, et cetera. What we do is by marketing and signage, putting the signs up, and we do a lot of demos. I do a lot with the lady who was here earlier, Rebecca, we do a lot of cooking demos at UBC Farm. So we'll show them how to make uh, certain salads and soups, etc., etc. And from that, you'll learn how to make it really easy. If food, you know what? People say, well, you're a chef, you know how to cook. <laughs> Not really. When I first was a young guy cooking, I was just doing it because I was going to be a hotel manager and tell the chefs what to do. I thought that was easy. But I just had a natural talent, they told me, and they said I had a big mouth and I'd like to tell people what to do. Even when I was 17 years old in the kitchens in Toronto, they said, but you don't know anything, but you're already telling people what to do. And I go, well, maybe it's that way. And I'm not afraid to talk and tell you what the facts of life are when it's related to what I do. So what we do is at these demos, I teach them how to cook. Now, at Gage Towers, what I deal with mostly is first, second year students. So when you go to Gage Towers, there's kitchen facilities in your rooms. They are now in the process, it's almost done, I'm involved, they're going to be building a kitchen demo where they want me to teach you how to cook. But we're not going to make duck confit, we're not going to make beef wellington, you're going to be making stuff that we can get food boxes in, etc., from local suppliers, let's say UBC Farm, et cetera, and I'll teach you how to make something that I was taught. When you make one thing from that, you should be branch out to five. So if I'm making, let's say, a beef stew, no, let's say, okay, I'm making a kale stew with um, white beans, uh, basil, uh, onion, celery, carrot, blah, 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 and olive oil. Now you have that. What I would do next day when it's chilled proper, I puree it. Now you got a white bean vegetable hummus by adding the right spices, and that's what I would put on instead of mayonnaise with your spinach, leaves, and maybe a cheese or what have you. I failed to mention that we highly recommend and highly support and very proud that we deal with Discovery Organics. As a chef, even though I'm trained, a good chef works with the proper equipment and the best ingredients. If you have the best ingredients, and I show you how to hold a knife so you don't cut your nail off, and you use the right um, utensils, pans, etc., the right heat, and you have the best ingredients, you can all be a chef. I'm not some of these pompous chefs, you know, they have all the collars with the, all this crap and you know, they walk around, right? No, no, you, you have the best ingredients, you can make it work. So as for the for the sustainability and for the bottom line to make a business, make this work, I mix the expensive with the cheap. 
okay? So I can afford the extra cost of, let's say, organics, etc. When we work with Land Food Systems Department and the Seeds Department and Dietetics and Health and Wellness, etc., it was shown to us, they said, do this example, and we were buying apples. Regular apples, whatever, right? And they said, why don't you use organic, local, from Discovery Organics? Well, it's going to cost more. They're going to have to call mom and dad, or they're going to have to call the bank and increase that bank loan. It didn't cost much more. And the best part is, from the six cases of apples I would buy a week, I'm up to 12 to 14 per week from their, from their apples that we get from them. And we'll bring in the fair trade bananas twice a week. Got to worry about the carbon footprint. I got to worry about the business aspect because I can't have Annie bring me three cases, four cases of banana on Monday, and that's the only order because I get deliveries twice a week. Third Tuesdays and Thursdays, we have to watch our carbon footprint. Otherwise, we're defeating the whole purpose of doing the right thing. And we go in season. It's stupid for me to buy certain things when it's out of season. I'll bring in a lot of fresh blueberries from the Okanagan in August, mass amount, and then we'll wash them, make sure they're safe, and then we'll freeze them and use them over the year. We lobby very hard, our purchasing director, her name is Vicki Wakefield, to get these suppliers on board. Source local, sustainable products, and because UBC is a big power, money talks, we have a big purchasing power, we can get more things done than the small guy. We work in collaboration, I said, with all these students and departments, they give us the ideas. I learn as much from you as maybe you learned from me. Anybody who says, I always say, anybody who says he knows everything is, is a combination of a fool and a liar. There's so much to learn. I'm 54 and I'm a better chef now than I was many, many years ago by opening up my mind, ripping open that envelope and pushing it and getting it out there. Through marketing and telling the story, through the demos, we've done a, uh, a number of cookbooks through the, the seeds department, farm to fork that we did and we would make healthy items and then that's going to be in a hard copy very, very soon. In the industry, it, it, it's known to say, and it, we were brought up that way, as a chef, once you lose that customer, you're going to work two, three, four times hard to get them back. You've lost them. So the trick is, the way to do it right is to get them right away off the bat, make them happy, prove to them that you're right, and do it consistently. Not this seagull of, uh, what's the word, uh, seagull, um, okay. We had a, a good friend of ours, he was a consultant, and he says, you ever heard of the seagull uh, syndrome or the seagull uh, effect? I go, no, I don't think I ever heard the word seagull. He says, well, most consultants, and I hope I'm not going to get anybody upset, but it is what it is. A seagull effect is a consultant. He'll come in like a seagull, fly over your operation, and then take off. Where's my 100 grand? We had a consultant come to me maybe many years ago. I was working in the kitchen and he was getting paid 50 grand or whatever they get paid. And he says, so what do you think I should do? And I go, what do you think you should do? You get out of here and I'll get the 50 grand and I'll work for half. You're asking me, that's your job. But that's the seagull effect. They just come in, fly, out, fly around, shit all over and take off. So I have no, and in our industry too, they'll say someone who's a consultant, I don't want to generalize, is because they can't get a job in the real workforce anymore. I don't want to get in trouble, but, you know, it is what it is. They just come, they can't get a regular job, and they say, well, I'm going to work two hours a day, I get weekends off, whatever, and then I'm going to tell you what to do, give me my money and take off. They don't come back to check how it is. They don't follow up. If they do, they want another 50 grand. Um, I always like to say that, you know, people say it's very expensive organic food, uh, local, fresh, etc. It costs more money, the labor aspect. And when I first brought in some fresh, actually, I think it was from you, I got some new stuff in. I uh, forget what it was, but three, it was about four or five years ago with some vegetable, I can't remember. And um, my cooks looked at me in disarray. And I go, what's up? Well, this stuff isn't washed. This stuff, it, it, it has to be cut. The peel's still on. Am I rocking too much? Sorry, if I make anybody sick. I go, what do you, I said, let me, let me, let me think this out. You're wearing a chef's uniform, you got an apron on, we have knives supplied for you, you forgot how to cut and peel? You know, you want, uh, get rid of those scissors and the plastic bag that you open up, you're gonna get back to reality and you're gonna start using it. Now, we only brought in, let's say, uh, five different things, five pounds each. Next day, we brought in some more from another guy, supplier, 
And they said, when you brought in five pounds, I always play dumb, right? It's sometimes the best way to motivate and intimidate or humiliate them. Did I put that out there anyway? So what I do is I go, well, who are you getting five pounds? I'll get more, chef. We got to get more. Why? This stuff's pretty good. It holds better in the steam table. When I serve it and I stir fry it, it holds. And the color holds and it's, it tastes a lot better. I'm getting a lot of, I'm getting a lot of compliments. Now that guy is no longer working for the paycheck. He's working for the passion and working for the, what he's getting from the, from the customer base, which is faculty and students and staff. Well, my, 30% of my food base comes from other out, outlets. They come to me, which is fine. And when Martha Piper, the ex-president comes, and this is how I do it, and they say, hey, chef, the food was excellent today. I go, talking to the wrong guy. Billy, come here. The lady wants to talk, I think she's a president or something, and I walk away. He made the food, not me, and I walk away. Next thing you know, I come back and he's saying, man, the president talked to me. Wow, I really feel good. You got him. You never lose them, you keep pushing them. Um, what is interesting, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> what is interesting is, is that the last few years, I'm getting a lot of tours from parents with their students, potential students. And I go, um, okay, so what's up? Oh, we just want to see what's going on. There's like 40, 50, sometimes 20, 10 people come in. And I go, so what's up? Sorry. Sorry. I just gave you a So don't, don't lose that tra thought, uh, train of thought. So they, they, I don't even need a microphone. So they came and the parents, and, I, and the parents were asking, what's your food like, chef? And I go, what do you mean by that? And they said, is it local? Is it fresh? Is it organic? Are you, getting, uh, are you getting enough apples? I go, Christ, I'm bringing in seven different types of apples. I'm bringing in fair trade bananas. I'm bringing everything in. Oh, you don't have, um, I don't know what it was, strawberries. I go, strawberries? It's, it's frickin' January. You want a strawberry, reminds you of a piece of cardboard. You gotta go in season. Oh, okay, chef, sorry. I said, oh, my kid needs this. I go, look, look at the uh, vegetables here. Roast potatoes with fennel. Oh, they won't eat fennel. Billy's gonna eat fennel by the time he's out of here. Guarantee it, one way or the other. He likes pizza, yeah. He likes whole wheat, no. Does he like multigrain, no. Well, if he wants pizza, that's what he's gonna get. The only thing that's white in my kitchen is maybe the milk. Um, so with that, now we're getting the athletic department. Oh yeah, going back. So the parents have told me in the last four or five years that what makes, one of the major decisions for a student, potential student to come to a university is what's the food? Where is it coming from? Are you doing it right? Many years ago, 30 years ago, uh, as a chef, you bring in something and the first thing you say is, how much is it gonna cost? What's it taste like? What do I get in the back pocket? Uh, free tickets to Canucks, whatever. We don't do that, by the way, because TV's on, but we don't do that. And we don't, I can prove that. Now, what it is now, where's it coming from? What's the carbon footprint? Is it fair trade? We're gonna check you out. Some of these suppliers are lying through the teeth. They just wanna get their bucks in. They're just jumping on the bandwagon, which we found out, not these two, obviously not, they're the best. And we're going, oh, you guys aren't fair trade. We won't even buy it. Like our people will totally search you out and make sure that you are talking the talk and you're not bullshitting us. Can I say that? I guess I did. You know, it is what it is. So we find this out. Now, the athletic department, all of a sudden, you got the coach from UBC, Sean Olson, and the previous coaches, and all these big meat guys are coming in, these big 6'8", 200-pounders. I go, hey, coach, what up? And he goes, well, we want to make sure they want, I'm telling him, this is what we kind of food you eat here with lamb and uh, free-range uh, seafood, sorry, ocean-wise, the vegetables, the fruit. He goes, healthy body, good performance on the field. And I always say a healthy mind gets you healthy marks, too. And I go, okay, very interesting. He goes, this is huge to us, that what you serve, how you serve it, and why you serve it, they really care about this. And then when I meet their parents, they're the same way too. We don't want Johnny eating uh, mayonnaise. I said, no, we have low-fat mayonnaise. We have both. We use a lot of uh, the fresh greens, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't bastardize and cook it to the point where it looks, it looks gray when it has to stay green. Um, the demand is there, as I'm proving too. The bottom line works. Suppliers are contacting us. I get a number of letters recently that say um, a grain company, quinoa, uh, barley, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Can you give a testimonial? Can you do another talk? I go, yeah, because we want to jump on. They can make money, but we want to get more food out there that's healthy. There's a market for it now in the schools and universities. 
It's so popular now, what we do at UBC Food Service, that our director has even given talks and discussions to our competitors. It's like Toyota going to Ford saying, this is how we do it. Totally open, transparent. The funny part of that is when the, when the, when the two and a half hour um, seminar presentation was over, he got resumes. And then people always tell us when we went to, I was at one panel discussion and how we recycle our plastics, clear plastics. And they said, well, you're UBC, you guys got lots of money. That's why you do what you do. And we go, that's bullshit. It's not what we do because it's the right thing to do. We can, we make it right and it works for us. Um, I have copies here of 10 steps to eating sustainable. And the first one, which I'm doing right now is educate yourself, shop sustainable, ask questions, reduce your meat consumption. I'm not going to give you it's a lot to read. Eat seasonal, grow your own, cook, learn for me, take back the tap, bottled water, the plastic, spread the word and enjoy. I have copies here or I can give you the, I can give you the website because paper. Um, if supply meets the demand, the price drops. That's, that's economics 101. It all, it's done, a, it's amazing what's happened now than it was years ago. More on border all the time. Our competitors are following our lead. They're, they're totally right on with us. And as I, I always say, it's not a fad or a trend. Here's one. And let me know, you put the lights out when I have to go. Um, I have an article that there's prisons in the state of Kansas. Minimum security. They have farms outside their compound. They're growing food, the inmates, local, obviously, seasonal, some organic food, which they give to the homeless and or sell to local food markets. I don't think it's a fad or a trend. Um, there is no waste. Any good operator use, utilizes all their waste. Use it just so there's no waste. A good example is, is that you can imagine how many pails that I bring in with mayonnaise and margarine and uh, they're like 16 liter plastic pails, et cetera, et cetera. And the small four liter pails of mayonnaise sour cream. I got, I got thousands. Being my background, I'm a cancer so we're a pack rat. We don't throw nothing out. I save it all till I find that person that can take it off my hands. I found that person three years ago. I'm driving down a certain street in, in uh, Vancouver and I look at this supply store and I see all these huge plastic pails, you know, like a 19 liter plastic pail with the lids. And I go, hmm, went inside, I go, okay, who do I talk to? I said, I got all the pails you could use. So now, the last three years, I, all those pails, I sell to him. It's a liquidating store and those pails get used to contractors for plaster or paint. And all those pails, I sell it for pennies. All those pails, the money they produce, go to two orphanages in Ukraine and Liberia and Africa. And the guy who owns this store visits this place every few months to make sure the kids get their clothes, get their books, the new roof on the school. So we make sure it works, that what nothing just goes out to make a new mountain of plastic. To do all this, <clears throat> to do all this isn't easy. What is? It's worth it. We have challenges and barriers, hard work, so what? We're young. I'm young. You're even younger physically. And for sure, in the final end, it's worth it. To make this happen, we need internal champions, visionaries, not dreamers. Dreamers are good, but dreamers sometimes are too radical and they're not logistically minded. So what we have is to make it work, to be realistic, to figure it out and have that support from our leaders to guide you, assist you. We're always on top of it. I get daily reports from our suppliers on the produce, on the fruit, etc., about crop failures, political unrest, strikes, uh, union worker strikes. It all hinders us at times, so we have to be flexible. And that's what a good chef does. Um, to end it, I know she's standing. UBC is a community and a global leader, therefore we have to do the right thing. So that's what we do. They bring it in to me. We follow, the, we follow the policy makers and me as the grunt, I make it work for the benefit of everybody. If you have any questions, I have business cards and I have more paper stuff to hand out or you can see me after. And um, thank you very, very much.